the recognition that non-monotonic logic can transform the nature of an individual belief. Thus, if you compound that, sort of the non-monotonic logical components um, or assessments with a recognition of meta-analysis leading towards infinite regression, we have the infinite transformation of just one belief. Think about an infinite regress of belief as being complicated. Think about the infinite transformational regression being even more complicated. It, it becomes ridiculous. So it's a waste of time, right? Don't, it's, good, it's good for conceptual beginning. It's good to get your brain sort of wet. It's good to get the neurons firing, wake you up in the morning thinking on a very general level. But once you come to this realization, you can, in a sense, abandon it. You can, you can reassess this level at a much, 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 much more advanced level. And there is some legitimacy to the claim, actually, when we start talking about the brain as being an actual biological organ, but we're, we're nowhere near that analysis yet. Right now we're more conceptual. But there is some legitimacy in contemporary discourse on precisely this point um, in terms of neuroscience and cognitive science, where I think epistem epistemology, contemporary epistemology probably, I, I would say neuroscience, cognitive science, and um, um, I just said it. Autistic research is where I think epistemology probably has its the most powerful social impact in a contemporary sense, precisely because of some of these very rudimentary concepts might lead itself to um, more precise investigations in terms of our analysis of the brain as a biological organ. Okay, number nine. This is very important. Here's a direct quote from um, from Schraub. Quote. Even if it did make sense to count the things, this is a direct quote, right? Even if it did make sense to count the things that we believe, it is pretty clear that the number would be indefinitely large. I would use the word infinitely large, right? Would be indefinitely large. And so an assessment of our beliefs one by one could never be, never be completed anyway. This is the thing that you have to, <laughs> I'm going to warn you right now. You're going to have to get comfortable with philosophy because what the philosopher will do is he'll get you, or she'll get you very comfortable in a position. He or she will describe that position so that the position makes sense. We will follow the implications of the assuming that position, and then we will show the contradiction in assuming that stance, and thus you have to deny the position. So this was all a warm-up. This is all an exercise. Everything that I just did um, has, in a sense, been falsified, right? Why has it been falsified? Because we recognize as Straub says, and I agree, I would just use a more selective term um, instead of indefinitely large, I would use infinitely large, but I mean it's, it's, it's just you know, nitpicking at this point on my, path, on my part. But the idea is it's just too much, it's overwhelming, right? It's too much, it doesn't make for a good conceptual framework. But the idea is now we're thinking about the content of our thinking. Right? Now, and this is exactly what Astro Boomboy said. So shout out to you, Astro Boomboy. Right? Now we're thinking about the content of our thinking. Right? We're thinking about the content and the organizational structure, quote unquote, of our thought, which is a good thing. Okay, so 9A. The problem of infinite regress, there could be, oh, this is a direct quote, right? The problem of infinite regress, there could be no end to the task of assessing my knowledge. And that should make sense now, right? So hopefully what I've done is I've made it profoundly obvious why, one, the transformational aspect of our individual beliefs complicates our assessment of the content knowledge because we recognize that if, not if, since the transformational aspects of individual beliefs is fact via non-monotonic logic, then all of our beliefs are subject to transformation, provided you're not dogmatically attached to your beliefs, which causes an epistemological tension between the skeptic and the dogmatist, in a sense. So that's one aspect. And then the second aspect, as I said, is that the meta-analysis of any individual belief lends itself to infinite regress. And we just read Straub saying exactly the same thing. So that should be, that should be clear and rather, uh, hopefully at this point, one day, if it's super boring and um, it's sort of like, duh, then I've done my job. Do you understand? Because the contents of your knowledge now is, is much larger because I just deposited in a, a free air would be mad with me. Um, I just deposited via banking concept some ideas in your head that's going to transform the ideas that you already thought you had. <laughs> but the cool bit of this why it's not banking is that I log on later at some point T1 and I see what you guys have to say about my lecture and I adapt. 
So this is a virtual adaptation in lecture style or what have you. <laughs> Alright, so 10. Since we recognize that a systematic analysis of knowledge cannot unfold by analyzing the individual beliefs a person holds, we just demonstrated that, I, I explained that ad nauseum, we need to identify a method for assessing large classes of belief. Right, so what we need then, since we can't talk about the, it doesn't make sense to talk about the individual beliefs themselves, the idea is, the idea is, in attempting to, so, The attempt, the attempt, or attempting to assess the content of our knowledge, um, may then, right, may then require the incorporation of, as he says, large classes of beliefs, right? Large classes of beliefs rather than individual beliefs, right? So large classes of beliefs, which is a technical phrase. large classes of beliefs. Um, and this is assessing large classes of beliefs all at once, right? Assessing large classes of beliefs all at once. Before I um, draw the picture, I want to uh, look on page eight for this bit. Um, okay, so Here's, 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 uh, here's the, what I think is the interesting part. The second paragraph on, column rather, on page 8. Even if it did make sense to count the things we believe in, it is pretty clear that the number would be indefinitely large. And so, an assessment of our beliefs, one by one, could never be completed anyway. Go down a little bit then. Obviously, there could be no end to the task of assessing my knowledge. If I had to investigate separately the source of each one of my beliefs in that series, and I explained what that means. And even if I succeeded, I would only have assessed the things I know about the addition of the number one to a given number, meaning that um, this would not include any transformational beliefs, right? That would not include transformational beliefs. I would still have to do the same for the addition of two and then three and so on. That's obviously the infinite regress based on, based on meta-analysis of individual belief. And even that would, now we're at a much, much deeper level. And even that would exhaust only my beliefs about addition. All my other mathematical beliefs, not to mention all the rest of my knowledge, would remain so unexamined. Obviously, then, the job cannot be done piecemeal, one by one. Some method must be found for assessing large classes of beliefs all at once. Bottom of the left column, last paragraph. One may do this, um, one way to do this would be to look for common sources. So individual belief assessment, not gonna work. Large class belief assessment, how are we gonna do this? Quote, one way to do this would be to look for common sources or channels of um, or basis of our beliefs. So we want to start with the base, basis of our beliefs. Okay. We're going to start with the basis of our beliefs. Uh, just, uh, just a little bit more and then I'll stop and go back to the notes. Basis of our beliefs and then to examine the reliability of those sources or bases. Just as I examine the source or basis of my belief that the suspect was in Cleveland, Descartes described such a search as a search for principles of human knowledge. Right? So in a Cartesian sense, the principle isn't the individual belief itself. The principle, rather, is the basis, the precondition for which we have attained the belief. This is very, this is going to prove to be a very, very interesting um, bit. Right, this is going to be proved to be a very interesting bit because now we're not looking at the individual content of um, a perceiver's belief, but the basis for an individual's belief. And we're going to use the Cartesian term at this point, the principle for the belief. So the principle for the belief is the precondition or the basis with which that belief inheres or resides. Let me close my cap so I don't run out of ink. Um, 